uh, of the class as well. All right. First thing we will do is we will kind of have an overview of the mobile world. All right. Let's just talk about um, the challenge that organizations face when it comes to doing development now that mobile devices have rolled around and how they how these can be addressed okay and then we'll actually get into start looking at the the course material itself as far as uh, Android apps um, as was noted um, and again it's one of those things that I had like kind of heard but was brought to my attention yesterday Android or uh, Google's going to stop supporting uh, Eclipse uh, at the end of the year now the dilemma is our book uses Eclipse uh, I downloaded uh, Android Studio and I, I had trouble with it uh, at first and I didn't have an opportunity to work it out. So we'll probably do a couple examples in Eclipse just because that'll, that matches the book and all that. But at some point you should make a point to migrate to Android Studio. Um, and I will migrate the examples. Supposedly you can import stuff. Um, but I, part of the problem might have been the fact that um, earlier today the internet was down here and I was trying to install um, stuff with it and it was like I can't wait to get to my car dealership because they have a solid internet connection you know <laughs> uh, and, and I was able to finish it but there's still something missing so I'm going to do today's example in Eclipse and I might do a couple other ones and again that might help you visualize the stuff uh, in the book and then as we get more familiar we'll migrate over to that. Uh, our course management system this semester is um, I, was, I almost said Eclipse uh, is uh, Canvas all right instead of Angel. Many of you probably have used Angel before uh, Canvas, um, I don't anticipate any problems with it. I mean, you folks uh, probably, you know, clicking one link is the same as clicking another, so I wouldn't expect you to have problems with it. The one thing I do ask you, though, is be a little patient with me because when I set things up, there's a chance I might, like, forget to enable something or, like, forget to click on something or forget one of the steps I'm supposed to do. So if something doesn't look right, bring it to my attention. Like, next week if there's no lab, assigned yet when you come to class on Tuesday. Bring it to my attention because maybe I just screwed something up. All right. Um, if an assignment doesn't appear on your calendar, for example, bring it to my attention because again, um, that's a nice feature of Canvas is you can look at and see all the stuff that you have due coming up uh, in, uh, in an upcoming week. All right. I'm going to focus on what's important uh, to this class as far as Canvas goes. Um, and class policies and so on. So let me log in. Keep in mind that your screen is going to look a little different than mine simply by virtue of the fact that you're enrolled in different classes uh, than I am and also that your role is of student as opposed to instructor. So you have different, you're going to have some different links and so on. Hey, by the end of the semester when I'm behind in grading, I might accidentally let my password slip so you guys go and take care of your own <laughs> grades. <laughs> okay, right on. Yeah. <clears throat> I have I have like um like missed missed uh, tabbing and typed my password on part of the user ID line. I like immediately went and changed it. Uh, uh, on that, yeah. So th that's why somehow I was in the wrong text box. I think I like didn't hit tab or whatever, and so I did that. And I might not even type the whole password in by the time I realized it, but I uh, I went and changed it like instantly, you know, as soon as I got the lab or whatever. All right. When you log in, you get this nice little dashboard, which which kind of looks neat. I've heard good things about the mobile app for this. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's, I, haven't, I haven't used it yet, but I have, I, I'm having trouble with my phone, but that's another story. That's why when I saw that message up there, it's kind of like, hmm, what kind of phone is it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, may, yeah, I think that's mine, yeah. Do they make calls? Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, but anyhow, you get this dashboard. This is a calendar that I was speaking of. If you click on it, you can see what is like due over a period of time. So for example, like these are the, these are the assignments that are due in my different classes. So you can I was going to say, you have five assignments due? In the no, no, these are all the assignments that are due for all my classes. Okay. Yeah. And you'll, you'll see the same thing. So like if at this level, when you're on like this level on the side, you're looking at your entire schedule. When you drill down and get into a particular course, then you are looking at just that course. So it depends where you are viewing it. Um, when, you, when you first go to it, you'll see recent activity. So you'll see like any kind of thing that I have posted out there. If I posted a new assignment, if uh, I've made an announcement, if I have, if me or someone else has posted to a discussion forum, in fact, here it's simply telling you that I created a, a discussion forum. So you can dismiss that by clicking the X next to it. Frankly, from my perspective, it gets a little annoying because like it tells me I created a new assignment. It's like, of course I created a new assignment. I'm the one that created it. You know, tell me if someone else created a new assignment and I'll be, I'll be happier. At any rate, the other thing, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm grouchy today. I'm complaining about, uh, just as I, in, in one breath I'm telling you how good Canvas is, another I'm, I'm uh, uh, goofing on it. The one thing I don't like is you have to click the menu, to, to, to click a menu option you have to click it twice. You have to click once to get the menu and then once to go into it, which I uh, don't like that. I wish you could like pin it, you know, and say just, hey, just always show the menu. <laughs> At any rate. Um, we have announcements that's grayed out because um, there are no announcements yet in this class. So if there was announcements, you would see it and it would have appeared on the home page. The syllabus, which we'll spend a good amount of time covering today. Modules, there will be a module for each week. All right. Is that the same thing as an assignment? No. Okay. This would be the same thing as like a folder would have been in in Angel. Oh. Yeah, like, well, yeah, and, and what I'm, what I'm going to use it for is I'm going to have a, a folder for each week. Oh, like the lecture? Like the, yeah, so the videos will go in here, gotcha. example code will go here, that sort of thing. You know, did, you, I wonder if the Canvas app plays videos, too. Because if you post it in here, it should be in the, accessible in the app. Um, I my guess would be that it will ask you how you want to open the video oh. and it will it'll go and do that. That would be my guess. Yes? Are you going to run this like previous courses and keep a couple chapters ahead of mine? Did I do that in previous semesters? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. Um, there's a possibility of that. Um, that's more dependent on my schedule. I mean, I, I like to do that, but sometimes, depending what else is going on, I'm not able to. You know, sometimes it's, just, it's a struggle just keeping even with everyone, you know, as, a, uh, as opposed to, to getting ahead. This class, again, I've taught it a few times, but I really have only had a handful of students each time I taught it. So it's going to be a little bit different. This is a big class for the Android class, and there's about seven of you, I think, seven or eight. And so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a different experience uh, for me, um, and, and, and we'll see how it goes. One thing I do, for example, I like to do in this class is, and again, I've been able to do it because it's so small, is, is grade things right in lab. That way I can, like, tell you, hey, look, just, you know, that should be over there or whatever, and you could take care of it and fix it right away. Yes? Uh, advanced Android, I've only had a couple people at a time. I've only run those as, as independent studies. Uh, the iOS class, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> the iOS class has been comparable enrollment to this class. I, I've had about, like last term I started out with about this many and we lost a few people. I was just telling someone, someone, someone asked me as I was walking over here because they said, oh, you have a new thing. I'm like, yes, yeah, for my Android class. They're like, oh, you're teaching Android? I thought you were an Apple guy. It's like, where do people get this? I, it's like, I, you know, I, I use the tools that are available. And, and you know, I don't, 
I don't have a, a horse in the race, as they say, you know. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm trying to learn, you know, I'm trying to teach development and teach in the platforms we need to. Anyhow, modules. There'll be one for a, each week, and the rest of them, I do believe, are not enabled, or they shouldn't be enabled. There, there is, there will be. Oh, like I did in Java, had the final enabled? Yeah. Well, right now it's not. I mean, the fact that it was enabled indicates that it's not going to be the final, regardless of what my intents were previous to that. All right? Yeah. All right. Assignments are here. And you can see, oh, I have the Dropbox enabled. This was imported from uh, an Angel. Uh, I downloaded the class from Angel, then I uploaded it. So it did it in some sort of, it did it in an order that it felt like it, essentially. I mean, there's probably some rhyme or reason to it, but yeah. Well, the thing is, is you should only see the one. This is the only one that's enabled, so that should be the only assignment that you see. And I'll make sure as you see assignments, they're not, they don't remain in this random order. They'll be in a more logical order. All right. What else? No. No. Uh, I'll get into that uh, in a bit. Um, there, there are weekly assignments, but I'll tell you, I've gone over like the examples in the Deedle book. And there's a certain point where everyone gets tired of going over examples in the Deedle book. All right? I get tired of it. You get tired of it. The people in the classroom next to us get tired of hearing about it. All right? So what I do then is I have not necessarily like a semester project, but I have like little like sort of mini projects. In other words, instead of having a lab due uh, every week, towards the end of the semester, I like group them together and maybe there's like milestones like yeah it's like you know this week you're just doing the GUI for it and then next week you're putting the functionality in or you're doing a prototype one week and then a final version the next or something like that so um, that's kinda how I'm, I'm planning on doing it we'll probably do a few examples right out of the book just to get things down and get the fundamentals down and all that and then as we progress we might be a little more freeform in our approach and do some fun things. You know, we've played games, we've had a blackjack game, we've written a blackjack game, and we've written a few dice games and just, uh, you know, and just have a little more fun with it than, than uh, the, the basic stuff. All right, discussion forum. It's a chance for you to post questions between classes. Um, you know, think of this as raising your hand in class to ask a question. Is It's a question that you think other people in the class would benefit from hearing. Um, grades, you'll see the grades on assignments. People, um, that's the people in, uh, in this class. Like if you need to email them or e email me, I would imagine. And attendance. Actually, it's, there actually could be a section in North Ridgeville, but there is no one there. So there's, there's no students in that class. Here, though, we have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I am assuming everyone's here. Let's see if I can, based on what I've had in other classes and all that, let me see if I can remember people. All right. Don't don't tell me. All right. You are Michael, right? Your picture's here too. So that that was a, that was a visual aid. Uh, Jesse Watson, of course, everyone knows Jesse. Man, the legend. Yeah. Uh, Michelle. <laughs> 
Sorry, I got to go for Garrett the. Yeah, yeah, you got to go for the. Garrett. All right. Mark. Okay. So. All right. So do not feel bad if I do not remember the other one, other three people in this class. And I know I, ha I know I have you in another class, and I am I'm going to say your name is. Charles. Nope. You win a prize. Go on with it. All right. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Nope. <laughs> All right. So you are Terry. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, Charles. Yep. All right. And Andrew. All right. So I did seven out of eight. Not bad. Of course, that's a little deceptive, right? The because, last two count. Yeah, the last, well, the last one definitely, you know, uh, not much credit for there. But I, I guess I do get the, you know, well, hey, I'm claiming it as a victory. I don't care what you folks say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's spend some time looking at the syllabus. And many of you have had me in classes before, and, and my classes um, are, are typically run the same with a little bit of variation um, one way or another. Um, whoops. <laughs> well, for this one, yeah, it had to be since then because um, this class didn't even exist until like three or four years ago, so this one is probably probably updated. Um, I, I was going through today when I was at the uh, when I was at my auto dealer and changing references to Angel to Canvas and also removing references to storing things on diskette. Alright, I did that today as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well this one I didn't get to. Okay, course syllabus. The point of all this is that there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me, all right? I aim to be very flexible and I aim to be very available as far as um, being able to get to me if you have questions. This is a small class and um, the, the, the advantage of that is that, you know, you have a greater opportunity to interact with me, to ask questions and so on. So, um, by all means, if you have questions in class, well, it seems already you folks aren't terribly shy about asking questions in class, which is a good thing, all right? So if you have questions, please ask them. Bring your questions to lab. The other ways that you can get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through uh, regular email or email through Canvas, all right? Calling the, uh, my phone number is probably not the best idea because I, I, I typically only check my email or answer the phone when I'm on campus. So um, it's better to send email. Uh, I will have office hours published. I'm sort of finalizing what those are. I'm not sure off the top of my head yet uh, what they all are, but by the, by the beginning of next week, I should have defined my office hours. But you know, I'm on campus for other things as well. And um, if, if the office hours don't work for you and you need uh, additional help, by all means, just let me know and we'll figure something out, right? I mean, you know, you can, you know, you, you can, you know, we'll figure out a time that, that works for everyone. If for whatever reason it's difficult to make it to campus, I can talk to you on the phone. We can arrange to have a phone time or an online chat. Or what I like is Skype. All right. I like Skype because I can actually see your screen. All right. And that way, you know, instead of you describing a problem to me, I can actually um, see what's going on on your screen. Yes. Oh, you, you have to arrange it in, in advance. You can't, you, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm just chilling on Skype waiting for people to, to call me. You have to, t yeah, you have to. Hanging out in the chat. Yeah, you have, to, you have to let me know that, you know, it, it would be like an appointment except it would be an appointment via Skype. So I apologize for any confusion there. Yeah. Pardon me? Everybody kept dying. Everyone kept dying? Oh, okay. All right. 
I thought I thought you meant me. I was going to say oh. because I've had the past two spring semesters, I have had uh, some physical problems, and it's like it's been a rough one. So uh, I hope I can make it through this uh, semester and spring semester um, unscathed. Pretty knock on some March. Pardon me. Your lectures just disappeared from YouTube after March. Not on spring. Yeah. Yeah. Surgery? That's why I broke my hip. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did do a lecture from my hospital bed. That was, that was a crowning achievement in my career, I think. All right, a lot of ways to get a hold of me. Pick one. And if none of these work, let's talk about it and figure it out. The description and outcomes, please read on your own. Um, store your work on diskettes because, as you know, um, if you use the machine here and you save a file, uh, it will not be here, um, you know, when you come back the next day. A word about that. The lab should be set up with everything you need to write Android applications. Probably just Eclipse, probably not Android Studio. I'll have to get on them to do that. That being said, um, it's sort of a pain to use the machines here. So if you do have a laptop, I would encourage you to bring it in. All right, it just makes your life a lot easier. So um, I do encourage people to do that. Um, just the, the navigating and the pulling stuff back in and importing it, it chugs away at your time um, that you have to actually work on it. As opposed to if you have it on your machine, you can run it, look at the results and so on. That's why I don't, I mean, I never use the classrooms machine when I do that. Uh, regardless of what software is installed, I'll bring my laptop in because moving stuff around, you know, there, there could be slight incompatibilities of what SDKs you have installed or whatever. And I just don't like to play that game. Yes? What works on Mac? What works on Mac? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Visual that, Studio's on Mac now. Yeah. Oh, right. I, I was not aware of that. Oh, yeah. that. That is one of the reasons why, by the way, there are two Android classes and only one iOS class. Is that um, Android classes, um, you know, you can develop on any platform. Um, whereas um, iOS apps, you have to use a Mac to, to, um, um, to develop them. Plus things like, pardon me? Yeah, a virtual machine, all right, uh, would work as well, but it has to be running uh, a Mac. The other thing also is testing is much easier uh, in an Android development, you know. Um, you have to get a note from uh, the CEO of Apple to run uh, your test programs on a test device and all that, whereas with Android, typically you plug it in and there you go, it runs. So it's a lot, lot easier um, to do that. All right. The, yeah, that, that, I couldn't remember his name. That, that's why, yeah. It's difficult to use an Apple product. Yeah. Instructor approach. This is your class. Again, my job is to help you understand the material. Um, your, the, the, the difficulty that you experience in this class or the questions that you have, I mean, it's like my job one to make sure I clear them up. All right. Um, in such a small class, don't be shy about asking questions. If you don't want to ask questions in the class itself, then talk to me after class or email or whatever. All right. Um, the worst thing that will happen if you ask a question will be if there's a question that's maybe specific to a problem you're running into, is I'll tell you, hey, let's talk about that in lab. You know. But other than that, no harm. All right. Late work. It's funny how you can try to say something and people get the exact opposite impression of what you try to say. All right. I wrote this section with the thought of conveying how flexible I am as far as late work goes. But many students upon reading it think, wow, this guy's really a stickler for late work. I better tell him when my assignment's going to be due at, you know, in at 12.01 instead of midnight. All right. I reserve the right to deduct for late assignments, but if you're late and we have been working together through a problem, if you're just having a problem with something and you've been asking me questions, we've been exchanging emails, 
or anything along that, that sort of thing and, and you're late, I probably won't deduct anything at all. It's like, you know, hey, it doesn't matter to me if you understand it today or tomorrow. You know, that in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter to me that much. Now, the problem is, is like, there, there are people in, in different classes that just disappear. I just never hear from them and then they reappear and they try to turn a bunch of stuff in, you know. I feel okay in, in deducting in a case like that. Now, if there's some personal situation, like you're ill or you have to go out of town or whatever, you know, I don't need to know like personal details or I don't need a note from a doctor or anything like that. Um, I just, you know, just tell me, hey, I, I have to go out of town, I'll turn in the assignment, I expect to turn in Friday instead of Thursday or whatever. All right, or next Tuesday or whatever. One or two late assignments is no big deal. If you find that you're continually being late with the assignments, that's a sign that something has to change, right? That we need to talk and you may need extra assistance or maybe you need to spend extra time or I need to cover something more thoroughly or something. So, you know, one or two late assignments, no big deal. A continuing pattern of it, you know, I can only be flexible up to a point. And when the end of the semester rolls around, everything has to be in. That's, that's sort of our deadline. So, bottom line is work with me. Keep me in the loop. And might I say, while every instructor doesn't have the same policy as me, most instructors are willing to meet you halfway. There are, of course, exceptions, all right? But most instructors are willing to meet you halfway, provided you keep them in the loop. And again, it's not like we need to hear your personal business or anything, but um, just keep us informed of that sort of thing. All right, there'll be two quizzes, a final, and 110 points. <laughs> right? 10? No, that's 100 points. Okay. Uh, right, 10, yeah, 10, all right, there you go. I misadded it in my head. Each quiz is worth five points, right. I think that's what I did in my head as I multiplied two, 10 points times two quizzes, yeah. Right, the two quizzes total are worth 10 points. The uh, weekly assignments are worth 70 points, so there'll be approximately 14 weekly assignments, and the finals are worth 20 points. Um, and then, uh, no real midterm, unless you want to count the quizzes as like two little mini midterms. Um, 90, uh, 80, 70, 60, and all that for the grades. Um, the 14 weekly homeworks, I like to be flexible, and therefore that could be off by a little bit, one way or another. You know, maybe we'll only have 13 or whatever. Or maybe we'll only have 12, but a couple of those are like bigger assignments that count double. The bottom line is if it doesn't end up to be exactly seven, uh, 70 points from homework, then I'll prorate it. So whatever the percentage is, you'll get that of 70 points and, and uh, that will count towards your grade. All right, here's the tentative schedule for your reading along. One thing in this class, um, probably a little hard to read, whoops, is... Yeah, um, not all of you have had Java, right? How many of you have had Java? All right. Okay, a couple of you yeah, are, are in it. All right, ever. So um, we're going to do a little refresher on Java. And we may not spend the whole week on it. We may just touch base here and there and do some things and all that. But I do think it's important to, to cover that. So this is a guide for your reading. But again, remember that I won't necessarily... Um, um, follow the book precisely. Yes? Are the quizzes out of the book or are the quizzes just general knowledge that you, we should know by that time? The second one. Oh. <laughs> yes? You haven't mentioned FAWs. FAWs? That's correct. I have not mentioned those. No. What? Teachers can oh. kick you out of class. I am Phil. Is that just starting this semester? <laughs> no, it started last semester. Yeah. Uh, I am. I am philosophically against that. That's why I never mention it. 
you know, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't believe in them. So I, you know. I think, I think if it got to the point where you need to throw somebody out, it, you could have done it regardless this entire time. I don't, I don't think anybody has been ever that bad or, or on that threshold of, man, I really want to kick you out, but I can't. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I generally have had good students. I mean, and, and the, people, the people that have been, quote, problems in the class are people that simply just don't show up. You know, and, 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 and that's like not really a problem, you know. I mean, if you're not here, you can't really cause me any problems. I mean, it's not like I'm losing sleep, like, why isn't this person here, or whatever, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, those are the kinds of people that I could give an FAW to if, like, the people that disappear. All right. Um, are we going to use Lollipop and Life Marshmallow, or are we going to use Um, that's a good question. I don't know. The one thing that's difficult about this is by the time you get a book printed, it has changed five times. So um, the idea here is that, especially on an introductory level, you know, we're learning some basic fundamental stuff, and the version doesn't quite matter as much to us as it might in a more advanced, in like the advanced Android or whatever. Other questions? Repeat, please. The book on the back says it has equal and instructions online on how to do it in the Android Studio. Oh, cool. Excellent. All right. Let's talk about the dilemma people face when it comes to mobile development. If you're an organization and you want your organization to have a mobile presence, whatever that means. You want your customers or your people that, that patronize your organization to be able to interact with your organization via their mobile devices. What options do you have? There's, there, what, what, are, what are the options that you have? Do you use mobile devices? Actually, I'm talking more of platforms, and I think we hit most of them. Oh, yeah. All right. Mobile uh, tablet is somewhat on its right. own plane now. Right. The oh my god, my hair is just sticking up horribly. <laughs> I hate when they have this. Let's cover this monitor so I don't look at myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's still bad. <laughs> yeah, but at least I don't see it. So <laughs> it's not as the fourth year. Beard is coming up. Two semesters ago. Yeah, I was concerned video. Mobile web is one of the platform choices. You were trying to put that on the screen. Yes. I didn't push the button this time. I promise. <laughs> Mobile web is one, and the other is native applications. And we're going we're gonna to do a spoiler alert right from the, from the start. So if you don't want to hear how this comes out, close your ears for 30 seconds. It's a good chance an organization will do both and will do all of these. It's not a choice of doing one or the other, but it's figuring out the proper mix and, and things like that. What are the advantages that a mobile website offers to a native application. All right, it's automatically cross-platform um, for the most part. Again, there's always slight issues when you start talking about different browsers. You know, the the Safari on the Mac uh, or on the I iOS devices versus Chrome on there. But for the most part, the whole idea of the web, the whole benefit of the web is intrinsically it's supposed to be cross-platform. You have a document, you can view it on any device as long as it follows the protocols of hypertext. HTTP protocol, FTP protocol, all that sort of stuff. All right, IP protocol. So. 
Intrinsically, the web is cross-platform. That means that if I develop a mobile website, I shouldn't have to develop an Android and an iOS version of it. What's another advantage of mobile as opposed to a mobile app as opposed to uh, a uh, um, mobile website as opposed to a mobile native application? It's easier to update. Sorry. Decreased size? Decreased. Pardon me? You don't have to download it, store it, install it. Yeah, you don't have to download. Easily. and they don't have to update. No downloading, storing, installing. A good word to say that is there are no deployment issues. In other words, if I have a mobile website that has my restaurant's um, menu on it and I change the prices, when do people get the new prices? The next time they visit that website. All right. As opposed to a native application, if they had an old version of the app, it's possible that they could see old, outdated information. All right. So it removes any deployment issues. Can we think of any others? Well, let's look at it from the other perspective. What are the advantages of native applications? Speed. All right. Why is why are they quicker? Already on there. All right. All right. It's already on there. It's using the device hardware. It doesn't have to make a trip through the internet to do things. All right. You can just download it. Other reasons why there might be speed. It's not network dependent. That also has the possibility of offline being able to access stuff offline. Well, what most browsers allow offline nowadays. That one's kind of. This one is a gray area. Yeah. All right, because browsers can, and, and again, if any of you, it's like I feel like I'm a, a salesman here, but in the mobile web development class, we talk about like caching, where you can cache pages so that people can still access that. But the problem is, is they would have had to access it before. All right, and the other problem is there's some things that you just can't do that for. Now, I will say, that is not all roses on the offline part uh, of native applications too. Some applications don't behave well and you know you might be able to do some things offline but some things you're not able to do also. And more and more they're dependent upon just some type of data connection nowadays. And, and again it was, it was amazing how I downloaded the, um, the, the install for Android Studio yet it was complaining because I wasn't connected to the internet. You know, I'm, I'm used to the, the old, sort of the old school mentality, let me download it and then I can go run it anywhere. And yet it did not like that at all and probably is the root of my problems. So this is a gray area, but as a general rule, I'm going to still give the edge to natives on this one, all right? Even though the edge is, it's a gray area. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. What's, what's another advantage of native applications as opposed to web applications? You know which, you know which OS you're building for, too. It's so you're not going to run this many specific issues as you would with. Exactly. It can be optimized for a particular platform. And sort of closely associated with that is that it can take advantage more easily with the other, for lack of a better word, components of the device. 
Now, you know, you can, you can and, and, and again, it is funny, because even this is gray area, because, you know, you can integrate with a camera on a website, you know, but it's much more straightforward when you're writing that native code. It's easier, it's less prone to problems and so on, because you're working to integrate with an iPhone's camera or an Android device's camera, all right? Um, it is hard to say because web apps have just, they've come so far. They, they absolutely so have. Powerful. Yeah, they, they absolutely have. There's so many things, so much that you can do. Um, I, uh, real quickly, um, you know, I, I put together, you know, with HTML5, um, and, and this is one of the things that people, you could do to sort of mitigate this, is you could actually create a native app using, like, HTML5 pages. And, 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 and do all that, yeah, absolutely. And maybe have some server thing on the back end uh, if you need that. But you can, you can put that together real quickly and maybe leverage something that you've done here on this side as well. Now, the advantages of one kind of become the disadvantages of the other. All right? Since we're focusing on native applications, we're going to look at these and we're going to see how these advantages of mobile web sort of play out on this side. The big advantage of being, uh, or the big disadvantage of this not being cross-platform is that you likely have to develop at least two versions of your app, iOS and Android. Pardon me? Thanks, Thanks Apple, yeah. All right. Now, Again, you know, almost everything I say there could be like pages of footnotes on, right? There's techniques that you can use to mitigate that, all right? For example, um, developing a, a application via HTML5 documents, all you sort of need to do is wrap an Android app around that or wrap a Apple iOS app around that. I, I was playing around with that a little bit over the summer, and it's like once you have this set of pages, you know, you just kind of have a wrapper around it, and you might have to do a little tweaking, and there you go. There's also platforms that allow you to sort of code in one format, and it creates, but, you know, those add an additional level, an additional layer into it of complexity and, and, and an area where stuff could go wrong. So, again, there's mitigating things, just like the deployment issue, all right? Um, you know, you can have it now, things that automatically update, and, you know, so you can sort of mitigate um, the problem of, of ha them having to download uh, and update it. All right, so as far as our mobile program goes here at LC, this is CISS 268, where we do the same discussion except from there, we make a left turn instead of a right turn and spend the rest of the semester talking about mobile web stuff. The fork. Yeah. Another fork is between our 260 and 265 class, all right? In the iOS class, we have this discussion and then start, well, 260, not 206. 260, we talk about iOS development. And then finally, 265, we have this class and then we have also the advanced Android. No advanced iOS. No advanced iOS. Again, we're, we're really limited by like how many credit hours can be in an associate's degree program. And also, um, you know, the mix between classes in your major, classes out of your major, uh, and so on. And um, really what it came down to is the difference between like this major and other majors are essentially like these four classes. So we have four classes to play with. We wanted to do mobile web, right? We're going to do an intro to Android, an intro to iOS. The decider was, hey, people with Windows can do Android, people with Windows can't do iOS, therefore we're going to have two Android classes. It's just logistically easier for us uh, to find labs, to, you know, Students, uh, whether they have a Mac or a, a PC, can do Android apps. So just logistically, it's easier. So it's not, you know, it's purely practical reasons that we have two of the one and <coughs> one of the other. It's more Java too, which is nice. Uh, I, yeah, I, I like that as well. Uh, I, I think that's a big advantage as well. Yes. Windows apps, the only 
or you can access on your PC. Is that the same on their phone? For the yes. Windows app? Yeah. For the most part, yes, they are. They are. I was wondering about that. Okay. And you can actually now, which is really cool, um, you can now put Android applications indirectly onto a Windows phone now too as well. Okay. You just you just can't download them from the market. You have to put them on your computer and then upload them to the phone. But Android apps will now work on a Windows phone. Excellent. Yeah. All right. What I want to do here is I want to show with the remainder of time today, I want to um, show you sort of the anatomy of an Android application and then talk a little bit about the first lab because the first lab really is largely about you navigating your way around the IDE, whether you use Android Studio or, or if you want to start out with Eclipse and being able to like find and run and test stuff. Uh, there's really no coding in it. Essentially, you download one of the Deedle's apps, import it into your IDE, and take some screenshots. That's really all, all you need to do uh, for that. Yes? Does that, like, cost? I mean, I can make available the example files. Yeah. Just like send an email to remind me. All right. You can find one. I think I even still have I think you can. I th yeah, I think. I'm not sure what the content is online, but I don't think like the example files it's, are. It's everything he's coded through the book. Okay. Is in, you can get it in one file. So that way you don't have to type everything out yourself. but it, if you think you'll need it, it's better to type it out yourself. Okay. No mind. All right. All right. Anatomy of an Android application. All right. Let's go in and I have the most obnoxious sounding alarm. It sounds like a rooster. <laughs> and oh man, that is so irritating in the morning. But it's exactly what you need to get up. I I, um, I have an earlier class, and then um, I really feel like how do I want to say I'm out of teaching shape or something because I was exhausted today after my first class. It's like ah, oh. so I, I took my car in, like I said, and I came home, and it's like I'm taking a nap. So I took a nap and. And a package came to the door, and that guy woke me up, and then my rooster's crowing woke me up at about 4.30. All right. Made, an, made another cup of coffee, and it was like morning again. All right. So I like <laughs> crammed an extra day in there somehow. All right. I'm going to go, and I'm going to import um, one of the applications from Deedle by going in here under File, Import. I want existing Android code into workspace. Next, I'm going to browse. I am going to pick the welcome app. And then I'm going to click finish. It's going to do its thing and there it is. All right. I should be able to run this by doing run as Android application. There's a weird thing about this. I had to do this over the summer. It tells me there's no compatible device. I unplug it, plug it in, and there is my device. Android Studio, I can fix that. Okay. <laughs> And here is the welcome application, ah, which it can't do because it has an old version of it. So I have to go and delete that old version of it.
If you ever get an error message like that that says um, that there was a, an, a, another version with a different signature, blah, 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 that means that there's an old version of it. Um, I do have Android devices that you can use to test your stuff. Um, the one thing I've noticed is that the emulators uh, are slow. All right, so therefore, uh, it's good to have an actual device. And of course, if you have an Android app, uh, I'm sorry, an Android device with a little bit of configuration, you can um, test it on your device as well. So let's try this again. Run as. Again, doesn't know it. And here it goes. It's installing it. And here is the app. Yay. Put it up on here so the people at home watching us can see it. My millions and millions of fans, of course. <laughs> uh, they're not watching us live, they'll be watching us on YouTube. All right. Um, but again, you see. I think I I think I tweaked the Deedle example a little bit, and I put two little bugs there. Um, but there's a message: "Welcome to CISS 265 Android Development." There's a little Android guy, and there's two little Deedle bugs. Okay. So, typically, this is what I do with an application: I show you the behavior of it, which in this case, behavior is pretty straightforward. Then we look at the the pieces of it. All right. So let's look at the pieces of this application. First of all, we're going to start with like the stuff that there is. How do I want to phrase this? We're going to start with the stuff for which there's actually code. And again, I altered this example I'm seeing here. Um, but there's source code, which is our Java code. Our Java classes. All right. So my Java classes are there. There's welcome.java. There is a assets where you could put other files, but there's none in this particular case. There are resources that contain, if you notice here, pay close attention, there's Several resources, and the first part of the folder names are the same. There's a dash, and then there's something after it. So, the first part of it is the kind of resource it is. A drawable is simply an image. Yes? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in, in this folder is a little Android guy, the bug, and the icon. So why is there more than one? All right, here's an icon. Here we have the same icon that looks the same except it's smaller. And then here's an icon, which is somewhere between the two. Pardon me? Okay. Essentially, you're right. The second part of a resource folder's name is what's called a resource qualifier. All right. There are any number of different resource qualifiers. This particular one relates to the density of the pixels. So HDPI is a high density, all right, where the pixels are closer together. LDPI is low density, where the pixels are farther apart. And MDPI is medium density, where it's between those two extremes. There's also extra high, and I think even an XX high. Do you add individual images for that, or is it just you add one and then no, you, you actually add individual images of it. All right. I, yeah, I mean, any sort of, any sort of image processing. There's, there's definitely a, a ratio that you follow. 
uh, for doing it. Um, trying to think off the top of my head what the ratios are. Um, medium density is considered to be like um, 160 uh, pixels per inch. Um, low density is considered to be like 120 and high density is considered to be 240. So if you do a little math there, you'll make the high density one 1 1.5 times the medium density. You'll make the low density one three quarters of the medium density. All right. And there's actual numbers as far as icons go, but as far as other images, we could do that as well. The, the up, upshot of that is the icon will be the same size regardless of what the screen density is, right? Because a smaller image on a lower density machine, the pixels are going to be further apart. A lot of pixels on a high density, the image is going to be the same physical size. That was very confusing to me the first time that I saw that, all right? that a bigger image is going to look the same size as a smaller image. Well, is how tightly the pixels are packed. High density, they're packed closer together. So, of course, the image is going to look a lot sharper, all right, when, with the high density. But the, the size of it, the amount of real estate it's going to take up is going to be the same or at least comparable to a lower density. We'll come back to cover this in, here, uh, in, in more detail later. The important part is in the resource folder, you have resources and then resource qualifiers. Now, the resource qualifiers tell you under what circumstance the Android system is going to use these files. It's not something you have to code. It's not like you have to have an if statement in your code that says if it's a high density machine device, use this one. If it's a low density, use this one. It knows, pardon me? Automatic. It's automatic. Right. Now, you'll notice, now, now again, keep in mind that high density and low density relates to the density of the pixels, not the physical size of the screen. That's another qualifier which we have on the layout file. The layout file, we have a layout, which is sort of the normal default, and we have a layout large for larger screens. Likewise, and this is neat here, we have a values and values-es. What do you suppose values.es means? No? Good guess. It's a different language. So a different kind of resource qualifier is the language of the device. So what we do is we put all of our labels in this XML file, strings.xml. And then by putting resource qualifiers, we don't have to change our app. We simply write it in, or we simply configure um, these control files so that if the device language is set to, in this case, ES, Spanish, Espanol, it will use these files. If it's set to anything else, it will use the values folder. So we could, to make multilingual support, if we wanted to do, you know, the most common handful of languages, you know, um, you know, French, German, Spanish, English, um, Mandarin, Hindi, whatever, we could have a separate strings file for each of them. And then the resource qualifier, again, it's not something we'd have to code, all right? But rather, we will, uh, it will automatically use the proper one. Let's look at the strings file. Does it give that from your settings? Yep. And what happens if it except for a language you didn't code for. Then you'll just get the plain values one. That's the default one with no resource qualifier. So like for example here, we 
we'll see that it's an XML file. Are you all familiar with XML, at least somewhat? XML is a way of storing some data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my text editor here, and I'm going to put this code in there because that way I can make it bigger and you can, you can see it. Some of the stuff might be a little hard to see. XML files are like HTML files in that they use tags to indicate meaning. So this is the version of XML that uh, this file is done in. This are resources. This is a string value. The name of the string value, value is hello, and the value for it is hello world welcome. This is a string value called app name, and it's called welcome. This is a string name with welcome, and the full message is welcome to CISS app, uh, app development. Inside my program, I'm going to refer to this. Android will then use that to reference the proper string resource file. So on an English device, it will show this. On a Spanish device, it will show I have it labeled Spanish, but this is actually French, probably because I know French better than I know Spanish. Pardon me? Something like that and throw them for a loop. I think exactly. Um, so it should be dot fr. Let me go and rename that. Are there certain names you have to use? Yes, there's a predefined list of what the resource qualifiers are. The idea is, is resource qualifiers allow you to customize for a particular kind of device. So based on screen size, based on pixel density, based on language are the three examples that we've seen so far. All right, and there's others as well. And you're right, those are predefined things. It's not like I could just make something up. Because remember, it's the Android operating system that decides which one of these to use. I mean, if you created a file with a, with a folder name, uh, my guess is it would just ignore it and just never use it because it wouldn't understand what to do. You know? If you put Klingon as the, the, the language or something like that, um, it would probably let you create the resource file, but Android wouldn't be smart enough to know like, when to pick that up. All right. So these are resource qualifiers. They go on the end of resources that tell the Android system when these resources are to be used. So this allows us easily to accommodate bigger screens. There's bigger screens, put more stuff on it, right? If there aren't bigger screens, put less stuff on it. Make bigger pictures for bigger screens. I think in this case, that's why there's two bugs. I think I wrote it so that for bigger screens, it shows two bugs instead of one bug. All right? The three kinds of resources we saw so far are drawables, which are images, layouts, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and then finally values, which are all of our string labels. So we're not going to have any hard-coded strings in our program. Right? It's all going to relate to one of these strings in the string file. That way we can easily change it and we can change it across the board. And that's really cool as far as maintainability goes. Because let's say we're a college and we call our students freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, like many colleges do. What if somewhere down the line we decide we want to call them first year, second year, third year, fourth year? I mean, I've, I've heard colleges where they say, are you a first year, you know, or whatever. And it's like a different way of saying it. 
Well, if you can imagine, if you had an application for a college and you use string literals throughout your program, you'd have to go track those down in every single place, in drop downs, in check boxes, whatever, and make the change in every single place. Here, by referring to this string file, everything is in one place and you can just make the change to the literal and the literal and that change will be reflected across your entire app. Hard, yeah, hard code, yeah, hard code nothing. Refer to one of these string values instead. Now, our layout is also going to be in an XML file. And there's a GUI view, but we don't like GUI views. Exactly. So we're going to look at the XML of it. And again, I'll do the same thing with this. I'll put it in my text editor so we can look at it better. The GUI view is displayed in an XML file. All right. If we think about this, again, it's, it's almost like you have in any software development platform, right? If you think of how many of you have done um, like ASP.NET web pages, all right? In ASP.NET web pages, for those of you that haven't done it, you have a ASPX file, which is your, your appearance, and then you have an ASPXCS file, which is your code behind that goes and actually manipulates all that stuff. It's the same idea here, all right? The whole idea of making software flexible and easy to maintain involves separating things into components. And, yeah, pardon me? Yeah, well, object oriented is an aspect of that. But yes, absolutely. Things are components. And we can then mess with one component without messing up something else, is the whole idea of this. In fact, as we, we see, we could make it so that we could plug in a different component for a Spanish language uh, version of our app and a different component for a French, a different ver uh, version for a big screen, a different version for a small screen. Simply by tweaking those components and the rest of the app can stay the same. Our XML file contains a layout, minimally it will contain a layout, in this case it's a relative layout, there's a couple of different kinds of layouts and a series of views. All right. This contains a text view, all right, which is the message that says, Welcome to Android Development, CISS 265. Notice that the text of it comes from the string file the field that's called, the string that's called welcome. So it comes from the field called welcome. All right? So we could just put within the quotes, welcome to CISS, whatever, but then again, we're defeating the purpose of having the component for that. And would have issues. This would actually be more, be more equivalent to the HTML itself. All right, because this describes what this screen looks like. All right, the fact that there's some text here, the fact that there's an image here, the fact that there's an image here, the fact that there's an image there. Pardon me? Like divs in a way or, or whatever other elements that you have in HTML. So here we have a text view, which contains text, and three image views. The one is the little android man, the one is the bug, and then the other one is the bug as well. A relative layout is one of the different kinds of layouts that you have, whereas you specify where things are in relation to other things. 
So for example, this text view is the first thing. This image view says that its layout is below the text view. This image says that this image is below that image view and this image is below the other image view. So one way that you can specify the layout is with a relative layout where you say where, how things are positioned relative to other things on the page. The other thing that you have is a linear layout where you say things just go in a straight line. First thing, second thing, third thing, fourth thing. I don't know why they didn't use a linear layout here. It would have made just as much sense and probably would have been simpler to do that. Yes? Question? No. Um, there are, but don't, don't stretch the analogy too much. All right? So linear would be, linear would be like they call in HTML the flow layout where you just have one thing, the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. All right? Relative would be like using relative positioning kind of in, in, in that or floating even maybe. Uh, I don't know. So, we define the different views. And again, the idea of this, I, I don't expect you from this lecture to like get all the views and to get all, the, all this stuff and all that. The idea is, is I want to like familiarize you with where stuff is. We will definitely drill down to cover this in much more detail. The point is, is what the screen looks like is in the layout folder in an XML file. So, images in the drawable, the screen layout is in the layout folder in an XML file. And our labels, our string literals are in the values. Okay? There's two more things I want to talk about. I'll go a little bit OT today um, and then we'll wrap up um, for today. One thing is the Android manifest. And that provides some information that is useful when installing and running the app. For example, it defines what the icon for this app is. And what the name of the app is. And what's, what gets run when we start up this app. We specify the version of the app that we're running. We specify the minimum version of Android that this will run on. So it's information about the app. We'll visit this and we'll look at, uh, as we add things to this, we'll look at stuff in there. The last thing is our Java code, which again corresponds to corresponds to this activity name up here. We notice this code is an Android activity. So, what does this Android activity do? Not much. In essence, all it really does is it sets the content view to that main layout XML. So it tells it, when this activity starts off, it tells it, hey, display that layout. So that's really all it does is it pops up this little screen. All right. 
So obviously this is a pretty simple app, all right? So there's not a lot of coding involved. But it's a good app to demonstrate the pieces and how the pieces work together. This is the activity. An Android activity, think of that as presenting the user with like pretty much a screen that they can do something with, all right? And in this case, the screen that they can do something with is this screen and all they can really do is look at it, all right? So the activity pops up this screen by setting the content view to match our layout main. That means in the resources, in the layout folder, pull the main.xml. And if we're on a larger screen, pull this one instead because of the resource qualifiers. So what's important for today, the location of these files, the notion of a resource qualifier which allows us to customize for different aspects of that, the images, the layout, and the string values, and then finally, finally the Java activity which like does the work, all right? The Java activity does the work that uses all those other resources to do its job. All right, next time we'll go into a little more detail and look at a little more involved um, application, all right? Are there any questions? Your first lab assignment, again, is simply to get Android running on something, all right, Android development platform. And my suggestion would be that you do it on your own machine, but you could do it here if you don't have a machine that you want to. But I think it would be a good exercise for you to install Android Studio or, or um, Eclipse and get that running. Questions? Yes? No, I have not. Other questions? All right, we're done for today. Is anyone going to the lab, by the way? Yeah, kind of. My thought? Anyone, did anyone then go there? No. Okay. I prefer to work on my own box. Or a new box that won't even boot, you can't even see a post boot screen, nothing pre boot. Yeah, no instead of, I'm not even going to bother each other, I'll just tear her apart and put the components into what I need for my old one and everything. But everything's still open, so it'll take.